I am mindful of the joy that you have on your faces and the faith that you have in your hearts. But having had several conversations here this morning, I'm also mindful that many of us have a real sense of suffering or sorrow right now. That this is a particularly difficult moment in your lives. And so, uh, as prolegomena, before we, we begin, I want to spend just a moment in God's holy word. We're going to turn to Romans chapter 5, but I want to call to your attention also the first chapter of the epistle of James and the first and fifth chapters of the epistle of First Peter. In each of those places, whether Paul is writing or James is writing or Peter is writing, you're going to find Christians suffering. And I believe that there was a catechetical teaching that whether young or old, when you came into the faith, one of the first things you learned was about suffering. That all Christians learned about suffering right from the get-go. And the promises that belong to us in Jesus Christ, the suffering servant who knows suffering and who redeems us in it, who saves us in it, who blesses and even builds us in it. Romans chapter 5 verses 1 and following. Therefore, which means that he's standing on the preceding four chapters, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations. Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. And perseverance, proven character. And proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Just a couple of quick notes. This word tribulation is in Greek the word thlipsis and its origin is in the threshing sledge a wooden platform upon which grain is placed and iron teeth are raked across the grain to strip off the husk and leave the kernel. Is that a description of your life now? Or has it been? The raking across your life or body and the stripping away of the husk and the leaving of the refined sweet kernel of faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Knowing that our tribulation brings about, and the word used in my translation, I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible, I'm pretty sure. Uh, this is the one that I like because it's, it's, it may not be real readable, but it is intentionally the, as close translation word by word of the Greek as, well, one of the fine translations that does that. Here, perseverance is translating the word hupo meno. Hupo, the prefix meaning under, meno, the verb meaning to remain. Because the trial and suffering produce the ability to remain under. The word patience is not some acquiescence. Oh, just hang out, wait, you know, if you wait long enough, the season will change. 
It's, it's not something blasé, and it's not something unintentional. This word means the power to stand under and stand in faith. Imagine the maw of the lion, because the context here is persecution. Imagine the, the mouth of the lion over you and you remaining in your faith in the Savior Jesus Christ, persecuted for your faith and remaining in that trust. And that, that pupomeno, that patience, that perseverance, that standing in faith produces a character, a quality of life, a certainty in God that gives us hope. And this elpida, this understanding of hope, isn't something that's pie in the sky by and by. Hope is something that we have now and is brought to completion in the world to come. But we have it because He has us. Does that make sense? Because He's got me. Because my shepherd cares for this foolish, sinful sheep. He protects me and He provides for me. His rod and His staff, they comfort me. That's where my hope is found. And when I look to my thoughts, they race about with anxiety and uncertainty. When I look to my emotions, they go up and down. Moment by moment, they change. <clears throat> but he remains steadfastly the same. I have to move on or I'll just start preaching. <laughs> and our hope does not disappoint. Our Savior Jesus does not disappoint. Because the love of God has been, I love this juxtaposition of preposition, poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. The Lord be with you. And also, also with you. Let us pray. <laughs> Almighty God, our merciful Father, you who have sent your own Son as the suffering servant and good shepherd, we bless and thank you to be sheltered under the shadow of your wings, under the caring and constant care of the shepherd's eye and strong arm to protect us, to provide for us, to love and to keep us. Today, Lord, I call to your remembrance, your promise to care for the suffering, for those who are needy, for those who are anxious, for those who are troubled, that you as their God and King, as their Savior and Lord, would love them, demonstrate your intimate companionship with them, and bless us all. That the love of God may be poured out within our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is within us. And so we pray in the name of Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Hold the line. <clears throat> the conference designed to defend the Holy Bible in a post-Christian world. The first presentation is called God's Word, the Holy Bible. Introduction. Mr. Roy knew his Bible. Mr. Roy Swicegood was a man of strong Christian faith. He came by it honestly. Mr. Roy was a descendant of the original Swicegoods who settled in Tyro, North Carolina in 1773. Those early <coughs> Schweissgoods were Schweissguts. 
They came with many other German immigrants down the great trading path from Petersburg into Carolina. They found fertile farmland on the east side of the Yadkin River. And there they made their homes and farms. Adam and Katron Schweisgut sold a piece of their land for five shillings in order to build the new Lutheran church, the Kirche, the Schweisgut meeting house. Since that time, the Schweisguts have been an important part of the Christian community in Tyro, North Carolina. Over the years, the Schweisguts meeting house was renamed St. Luke's Lutheran Church. About 200 years after that, I became its pastor. My first call over 40 years ago was to St. Luke's Church. And I will never forget Mr. Roy Swicegood. By the time I came along, Mr. Roy was in his 80s. He was an 80-year-old man of faith. There was not much he had not seen, and I not, did not see anything that shook his faith. He taught me about life and faith. Here is an example. One day I was teaching a Bible study. There were lots of people in the class because it seemed that everyone in Tyro wanted to study the Bible. I did not know it at the time, but Mr. Roy had been the principal of the local elementary school. He had begun every school day with a Bible lesson, a prayer, a pledge to the flag for about 50 years. Mr. Roy <clears throat> knew his Bible. So, as I was saying, I was teaching a Bible study. Now, I do not remember the exact verse of the study, but I do remember that someone asked me a question. It was about some person whom I did not know. Perhaps it was Mophibosheth or Jacobed. I do not remember now. I only remember that the question hit me like a ton of bricks. I was so stumped that I could not even mumble a stupid answer. <laughs> so I was stuck, and then people began to look around the room for Mr. Roy. Pretty soon, I was looking at Mr. Roy, too. <laughs> Do you know the answer, Mr. Roy, I asked? He gave me a gentle smile and he said something like this. Well, Mephibosheth was the son of Jonathan, grandson of King Saul, and David honored him by restoring to him all the lands of his father and seating him at King David's table. The point is that he was never going to embarrass me. And he would never have answered if I had not asked. He was not going to hurt me. He was there to help me. I saw it over and over and over again. Mr. Roy was determined to bless me. I was so young and inexperienced, I gave the expression, wet behind the ears, new meaning. <laughs> Mr. Roy gave the expression, man of God, new meaning for me. He knew his Bible, and he tried hard to do what it said. He had been teaching the Scripture for 50 years, and he had been living according to the Scripture to the best of his ability for 80 years. I'm not saying that Mr. Roy was perfect, but I am saying that the number of lives that he touched and the number of souls that he influenced for good and for God was beyond measure. Today, men like Roy Swicegood, Mr. Roy, as I call him, are not easy to come by. Today, it would not even be legal for Mr. Roy to read his Holy Bible over the elementary school PA system, much less lead the students in a prayer. 
This is a different day. May I say it again? This is a different day. We need faithful men and women who will study, teach, and defend God's Holy Bible more than ever. Amen? Amen. Amen. End introduction. Point one, the inspired word. Why do we say that the Holy Bible is inspired? Where do we get that kind of language? The Bible itself tells us that it is inspired in 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. All scripture is inspired. But what exactly does that mean? The original word that Paul used when he wrote to Timothy was in Greek. The word inspired in Greek was theo pneustos. Theo meaning God and pneustos meaning to breathe or to blow. Isn't that interesting? All scripture is God breathed or blown out of the breath of God. That is to say that the Holy Bible is born of God. It is God's book. It has God's power and it accomplishes God's purposes. As the Bible teaches us in Hebrews 4 verse 12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. The word of God has life, and it has power, all of its own and in itself. It judges the very thoughts and intentions of human beings. This is true of all Scripture. For the Bible says all Scripture is inspired. Not just some portions of it, or the portions that I like, or the chapters that make me feel good, or the verses that make sense to me. No, the Word of God says every word of every book is God breathed with God's power and God's purpose, no matter when it was written or which person wrote it. The Holy Bible as a whole and in all of its parts is the wondrous Word of God. Here is a miracle. God used human beings to write His Bible. God inspired people who had seen the work of God and heard the voice of God. He inspired them to write His Word in 1 John, the first chapter, verses 3 and 4. The Apostle writes, What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be complete. It completed their joy to write so that you could know the Father and the Son and have their joy the joy of God in you. The Bible was written by people who had seen God in action, but there's more. Without ceasing to be their own unique persons, they were specifically inspired by the Holy Spirit to write God's Word as God would have them to do so. 
they were chosen and used by God as his instruments, writing in accordance with God's perfect will, though they were human beings, with their own hands and with their own thoughts, with their own purposes, they were inspired by the Holy Spirit in such a way that they produced the Holy Bible written by the hand of God with the mind of God for the purpose of God. 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. But men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Moved by the Holy Spirit, inspired writers wrote God's inspired Bible. As the Word of God, it is the pure and sure source of God's truth. The Holy Bible deserves our reverence because this is God's Word. Delivering God's commandments and declaring God's promises for all people, for all time. Through these scriptures, God communicates Himself to us. God's inspired word carries God's divine authority. The authority of the Holy Bible is not dependent upon whether I agree with it not dependent upon whether I understand it or even like it. It simply is the highest authority in all creation because it comes from God. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The Holy Bible does not me need me to confirm it. I am not its judge. I have no position of power or authority over it. God's Holy Bible has power and authority over me. It is the word of Almighty God. I cannot change it with reasonable logic, cannot amend it with social customs, cannot ignore it with political correctness. It is the Holy Bible. As God's inspired and eternal word, the scriptures have absolute authority. We do not judge them, they judge us. It is like the fellow who walked into the Louvre Museum in Paris, France. He was standing <clears throat> in front of the Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci. And as he stood there, the curator of the museum came and stood, unbeknownst to him, beside him. And the fellow said over his shoulder, when he realized that someone was there, I don't see what all the fuss is about. This ain't so great. I'm not impressed. To which the curator responded, Sir, the beauty of this painting and the extraordinary ability of this artist have long since passed the test of time. The painting is beauty itself. Now we no longer judge it, it judges us. In an even greater way, the Holy Bible is truth itself. We do not judge it, it judges us. Point two the inerrant word. The Holy Bible has long been recognized as inerrant. But what does inerrant mean exactly? To be inerrant means to be without errors. There are no erroneous statements, either of time or place, of person or thing. The word of God is true when we understand it, and it is true when we do not. It is true when it conforms to the laws of science as we know them, and it is true when it does not. 
It is true when it is reasonable and makes sense to us. And it is true when it does not. For example, it is true that Jesus is the eternal Word of God made flesh in time and history. It is true that He is truly and completely God, and He is truly and completely human. It is true that upon the cross, Jesus took all of the sins of all of the world, and that in so doing, He became sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of Christ. All of these facts are true, and without error, even though we cannot possibly fully understand or comprehend any of them. It is true that God created the first man, Adam, and the first woman, Eve. It is true that Moses parted the Red Sea and that Jesus walked on the water. It is true that Jesus rose from the dead on the third day and that he will come again descending from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God. Woo! That will be something. The dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up in the air together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord. All of these facts are true and without error, even though modern science can never prove them. It is true that Almighty God has sent His only Son to save slaves to sin. That Jesus knowingly gave Himself up as a sacrifice to appease the wrath of God for you and me. And that Jesus knows every sin, sick, and selfish thing that we have ever thought, said, or done and that He still loves us desperately and eternally and personally. All these facts are true and with error, though they defy all human reason. You and I stake our eternal hope on these facts of our faith. You and I believe these things not because we understand them or scientifically can prove them or because they follow the logic of human reason. We believe these facts of faith because this is what the Bible tells us. It is that simple. We believe that the Bible tells the truth without errors. We believe that the Bible is inerrant. Now think for a moment. What happens when a person is taught to believe that the Holy Bible is not inerrant? But that the Bible contains errors. What happens when a person believes that the scriptures are not true. That person might as well throw the Bible away, for that person, there is no word of God. What would happen to you if there were no word of God? If there were no word of God, there would be no history of God's salvation of humankind. There would be no message of judgment and forgiveness. There would be no written promise from God of His mercy and salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. If there were no word of God, there would be no certainty of saving faith. For faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Christ's word is here. In the Holy Bible, His Word comes to you to create faith in you. <clears throat> you place your faith in the Jesus of the Holy Bible. And because you believe 
that the Bible tells you the inerrant truth about Jesus. You have faith, and by grace we are saved by that faith in Christ. If there were no Word of God, there would be no unity in the church. What unifies us? Is it that we like each other? Is it that we're always kind to each other? Is that that we would never disappoint or hurt each other? No, 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 no. We are united by a common faith that God gave to us in His Word. The foundation of our faith is the truth of God kept without error in the Holy Bible. Everything that we know, trust, and believe is found in the inerrant Holy Bible and would be lost without the inerrant Holy Bible. Three, the infallible Word. We also declare that the Holy Bible is the infallible Word of God. What does infallible mean? This word literally means without fault. And that, frankly, sounds a lot like inerrant, without error. But truthfully, there is not much difference in their definitions. But when it comes to the Bible, the two words have been used distinctly. Inerrant means that the Bible has no errors. Infallible means that the message of the Bible is without fault. The teaching of the law of God and the sin of humanity is without fault. The truth of the gospel of God, of justification by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, is without fault. The Holy Bible is trustworthy as the first and final authority in all matters of faith and life because it is without fault. It delivers God's infallible message of salvation. You see how it's used in that way. What happens when we in, come in doubt, when we are told to doubt the infallibility of the Bible? There suddenly is no certainty regarding the message, regarding what we believe, teach, and confess. The teachings of the Bible are called into question. Is it true that God gave Moses Ten Commandments? Is it true that breaking those commandments is an offense and abomination to God? Is it true that God hates and punishes sin? Is this teaching true? Yes, yes, and yes. Is it true that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world? Is it true that Jesus took upon himself your sins and the sins of everyone else? Is it true that all who have faith in Jesus receive the forgiveness of sins, the promise of eternal life and salvation? Is this teaching true? Yes, yes, and yes. Is it true that God's word confronts our sin and calls us to repentance? Is it true that God's Word gives and sustains our faith? Is it true that God's Word delivers God's forgiveness? Delivers God's forgiveness and declares God's righteousness to all who believe. Indeed, declaring you righteous by grace through faith. Is this teaching true? Yes, yes, and yes. The Lutheran pastors are already clicking in their heads. Communicatio idiomatum. Whether you use that term or not, you are thinking the imputation of the sin of man onto the cross of Christ, the imputation of the righteousness of Christ onto the sinful man or woman by grace. This transaction of glory takes place in your heart because of faith. And even that faith is not something you have earned or deliberated or created or manufactured, but it too was given 
by God's grace, His merciful word at work in you by the Holy Spirit. Departed a bit from the manuscript. <laughs> <laughs> How do we know these yeah. things? We know them because this is God's message to us in the Holy Bible. This is not a faulty message. It is an infallible message. To say that the Holy Bible is infallible is to say that it is the trustworthy authority in all matters of faith and life. The message of faith and life is not contrived. It is not confusing. Indeed, it is clear and understandable. This, too, is contained in the meaning of the word infallible. St. Paul writes to his spiritual son, as recorded in 2 Timothy 3, 16, From childhood you have known the sacred writings. From childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. God's Word has clear teaching about salvation. It has clarity for the young and for the old. The word that is often used here is perspicuity. Perspicuity. <laughs> This means that the Bible presents in a language that can be clearly understood by all people how it is that one comes to be saved by grace through faith in Jesus. This too is included in the word infallibility. One day, while serving as the pastor of St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Tyro, North Carolina, I received a phone call from Pinky Williams. Now Pinky was a retired man who often sat on his front porch rocking and watching as the cars went by. Pinky called up and he said, Preacher, why don't you come by and see me today? I'd like that. And I said, all right, Pinky, I'll come on over this afternoon. This is a true story. <laughs> you know, I... I drop into that southern accent because, uh, well, I was, I was schooled in North Carolina and I served churches in North Carolina. I went to a college in North Carolina, I went to seminary in South Carolina. But it was in St. Luke's Tro Tyro where I was really given seminary instruction. I buried 18 people, I was 25 years old, I buried 18 people in about that many months, my first year at St. Luke's Church. And I watched Jewel Peck hold his wife's hand as she died, and I watched Jewel grieve and stand in his faith. I watched people lose their babies and people lose their parents and wives and husbands lose each other, and I learned about faith in a, a classroom, somebody's bedroom. It's a great gift to be a pastor and to learn of real faith in the hearts of God's people. So when I went over to Pinky's house, he was setting. He wasn't sitting. He was setting on his front porch, <laughs> rocking in his rocking chair. And there was a rocker there for me, so we sat and we talked and we rocked. And after a while, Pinky got up and he said, Preacher, there's something I want to show you. So we got up and we walked around the house and Pinky kept a garden of about 10 acres or so with some chickens and a goat. And we walked a little ways up over a hill and Pinky pointed out in front of us and he said, Looky there, preacher. What do you think that is? It was a pile of burnt wood. And I said, Pinky, I don't believe I know. <laughs> and he said, Well, that's my old brooder hen house. He said, uh, it got 
struck of lightning the other night. And I come out the next day and I found it all burned up. And he, uh, by that time we got to this pile of wood. He said, uh, <coughs> Well, I started kicking around in the ash. That's how they say ash. <laughs> and, uh, Preacher, you know what I found? I said, Well, I don't believe I do, Pinky. <laughs> he said, Well, I found that old brooder hen's dead carcass. And when I kicked it over, Preacher, you know what I found? I, I said, what is that, Pinky? He said, I found all them little chicks. And I realized what happened. He said, when the lightning struck that hen house and it caught fire, that old brooder hen started clucking them chicken uh, up under her, he her, her feathers, up under her wings. And she called them up under herself. And she kept them all safe in there. Until she died. And the next morning, I, I kicked her over and there they all was alive. And he looked at me and he says, You know what that is, preacher? I said, What? Thank you. He says, That's like Jesus. And he smiled and kind of turned his head. That's just like Jesus. And we walked back to his house. And I, I realized that, well, that was the Word of God. That was the truth of salvation. That was the infallibility of the Word of God in Pinky Williams' heart. Shared one Christian to another with a young preacher who hardly knew anything at all. Conclusion. Inspired Inerrant, infallible. Roy Swicegood taught the Holy Bible and prayer to the children of Tyro Elementary School over the PA system of the local elementary school for almost 50 years. I'm sad to say that the day is gone when that can be done. Neither Mr. Roy nor anyone else is allowed to do such a thing today in our public schools. This is a different time. Today is what some have called a post-Christian culture. At this time in our nation's history, many people do not believe that the Bible is the Word of God. Some want to adjust the Bible or correct the Bible some will take authority over God's Word and some will simply ignore God's Word. Some may say that the Bible contains the Word of God, but they will not say that the Bible is the Word of God. And so we hear questions like, which parts really came from God? Which verses did Jesus really say? Which parts are really inspired? Some of the books or all of the Bible? Which facts are errors? Which facts are true? Which message is faulty? Which message is infallible? What law stills apply today? Which commandments can we discard because of our modern customs and our new culture? Is there really a heaven? Is there really a hell? Is there really a right? Is there really a wrong? Is Jesus really the only way to be saved? Or are there many roads to the top of the mountain? You really don't believe that stuff, do you? It's just myth and parable. No. The Holy Bible is the eternal truth of God's Word. Some will equivocate when the Bible appears to conflict with scientific fact or with human reason or with modern culture. Whatever their justification, these persons have rejected the Bible as the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God. The American Association of Lutheran Churches stands in the tradition of the old ALC, the American Lutheran Church. Our Constitution says this simply. 
The American Association of Lutheran Churches accepts all the canonical books of the Old and New Testaments as a whole and in all their parts as the divinely inspired, revealed, and inerrant word of God and joyfully submits to this as the only infallible authority in all matters of faith and life. We believe, teach, and confess that the Holy Bible is inspired, God-breathed. It was produced and it is preserved by the Holy Spirit. As a whole and in all of its parts, it is God's Word, it has God's power, and it accomplishes God's purpose. It has God's power and it accomplishes God's purpose. The Holy Bible is inerrant. It contains no errors, whether its facts agree or disagree with science, reason, or culture. It makes no difference. The scriptures are true. The Holy Bible is infallible. It is God's absolute authority in all matters of faith and life, delivering the absolute truth of God's message of salvation to young and old clearly by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It is critical today for the sake of our faith and for the sake of the generations still to come that we hold the line and defend our faith which is based upon the truth of the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God, the Holy Bible. Be not daunted or dismayed on this day, this critical day, when in our, indeed, our own culture, even Christians are questioning the authority of the Bible, our Heavenly Father does not say, Oh my, I never expected that. <laughs> As if He did not know from the end, from the beginning, all that is the end, and from the beginning, this day, and your place in it. For you were chosen to be here at this time where He has placed you for the people whom you know and see and touch and bless and with whom you share this truth. Amen.